What you got there, Sasha? It is our new book! <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting! When Kids Say They're Trans is now in print. And this is a book for parents who want their children to flourish, but who don't believe that social or medical transition is the best route for their health and well-being. And we think parents know their children better than anyone, so this book will give you the confidence to trust your instincts and also offer you some practical tools so you can be more effective in helping your child. So please visit our website, wekidsaythertrans.com, to order your copy today. Hi, Stella. Hi, Sasha. How's it going? It's going well. Uh, we had a guest on today that we've been wanting to have for a very long time. Yeah. Corinna Cohn joined us. There's some guests and we're almost surprised that they haven't been on. And for those guests who are listening and thinking, why aren't we picked? You are picked. We just haven't <laughs> got it together. <laughs> what I say. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, Corinna's the co-host of the Heterodorks podcast, which is an amazing program with Nina Paley. And um, today, you know, we end up talking about yeah. Corinna's arc of like experiences around gender, transition, and then kind of coming to a place of futility, realizing like, actually, you can't change sex. And Corinna described this really interesting process where as a boy, Corinna thought, once I have this SRS, that will be like the end of my transition. I'll officially be a woman and I can move on with my life. And of course, discovered that that's not really how it works. And that's not how reality works um and this this is a key as we say in the in the in the in the podcast this is a key aspect of mental health where so many people for example anybody who has had anything to do with addiction they think uh, for example i'll just drink beer i won't drink top shelf i won't drink spirits i'll just drink on the weekend i won't and constantly making rules and deals and bargains with themselves and it sounded very similar the way uh, corinna was like when this happens, when that happens, when yeah. I get it right, always. And then one day coming to this yielding, this powerlessness, I I, I can't keep on fighting. I've come to the end of the yeah. road and now I'm turning back to, to reflect on it. it. It was a very yeah. sad episode in a way, but it was actually, it was really, really thought provoking. It was, I thought it was really, really interesting. Yeah, we also talked a little bit about Corinna's testimonies and legislation and how things are going in America. So it was a really timely and great episode. Yeah. And uh, we'll just read a little bit more about Corinna. So Corinna Cohn is a writer, podcaster, and activist from Indiana. Corinna was diagnosed with gender identity disorder at age 15 and underwent surgical transition at age 19. In 2019, Corinna became involved in patient advocacy and in 2022 began organizing to support legislation that regulates gender medicalization with minors. Corinna has met with legislators and given testimony in Indiana, Texas and Ohio, which you'll get to hear about in just a few moments. So here's our conversation uh, with. I just want oh. to say that. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Corinna will be speaking at the conference at, our, oh, yeah. at the Genspec conference in Denver about this subject, about political organizing. And she's been a powerhouse, a phenomenal, phenomenal level of um, legislation and impact Corinna is making. So we'll listen yeah. to it now. Hi, I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Through in-depth interviews, personal stories, and psychological exploration, we probe the gender landscape within contemporary culture. And we consider the implications of prioritizing personal identity over other aspects of the self. This is the thinking person's take on gender. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. Hi, Corinna and Stella. Well, hello, Corinna. Hello, hello. It's good to see you on the screen. Yes, yeah. in live, I get to actually talk to you rather than just being like, oh, that was an amazing comment. You can actually <laughs> respond to me now. <laughs> the last time I saw you in person, we were having to speak at each other with raised voices because we were in a busy restaurant. Yes, and through the sides of our mouths, because you were yes. to my left. And I was like, hey, Corona. Mm -hmm. that's how it went. <laughs> but that sounds good. Um, <laughs> we're, we're so excited to have you. We have a lot of interesting things we'd love to talk to you about. Um, we, we were kind of talking before. We think some of our audience may know you. Some may not. So maybe we can just kind of talk about your story in terms of like 
your gender identity, your transition, and how you became disenchanted with the whole thing. So would you be willing to kind of start us off there? Sure. Um, like a lot of other boys who seek transition, I was one of those weirdo kids. I, at a younger age, like kindergarten and first grade, had mostly female friends and uh, played on the monkey bars with them. And after a little while, the adults would um, really push me to keep from playing with the girls and, and form more uh, friendships with boys. And that didn't go super well. Uh, I was one of those kids that was always picked on. I had uh, probably, in retrospect, I had some sort of um, social, how would you call it? So I was, I was behind socially. I was one of the younger kids in my class. I have a, a birthday in June. So I was, at that time, I was probably, uh, if not the youngest kid in the class, one of the youngest. I was just socially behind. Mm. That made me awkward, made me sort of a, a pain for other kids. And I was bullied a lot. And by the time I was uh, towards the end of that uh, elementary school phase, I was really starting to ideate about being a girl. I thought that a lot of my problems could be solved if I didn't have to try to act like a boy or be a boy. And if I could go back to the period in time where or that, where I was able to have like friendships with girls, that that seemed like uh, it would be a lot easier to for that to happen. And then um, as I got into middle school and high school, that ideation got very intense and I started developing uh, crushes on some of my male school mates and just uh, it, it, it was not a great thing to go through. So at the time that I was 15 years old, I told my mom uh, finally that I wanted to be a girl. And she had sent me to a psychologist who was a child psychologist who I had seen at an earlier period because of some of these um, problems when I was in, the, in that uh, first, second, third grade period. And she diagnosed me with what was then called gender identity disorder. And that some of the family dynamics at the time were probably contributing to my uh, lack of self-esteem or, or being able to relate to to my sex. And my parents stopped me from seeing her. And uh, so I was basically left on my own from that point forward. But when I was 17, I was one of the very early internet users uh, when it was getting popular. Uh, this was before the World Wide Web existed. And I found a community of trans people online that finally was a community that understood what I was going through. They helped me understand what it was to be trans. They gave me a lot of affirmation and support. And it was a, a community or a family that I didn't have in the real world. And from that point forward, gaining access to uh, hormone replacement therapy and being able to find a surgeon that those that was just made very, very easy. My father had put aside a college fund for me, but it was had no restrictions on it. So when I was 18, the money that had been set aside for college instead went for a sex change operation. Wow. And what year was that when, when you started the medical aspect of this? I started the hormone uh, estrogen in 1993. Okay. And then in 1994, had surgery. It's, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm the same age as you. And mm -hmm. so while you were kind of being, acting like a girl, let's say in, where, where are you from? Whereabouts in America are you? Nevada. Nevada. West, West, Western Nevada or Western there, uh, America. There is me in Dublin, uh, kind of going through the very same but opposite experience. 
And I do think that there's a lot more room for a girl to be a tomboy than a boy to be girlish. And I think that really impacted you um, more destructively than me. It, it, continuously, each each point of that journey, you said, like, I think it wouldn't have been so difficult as a girl as it was. Now, other people could argue, but it feels like that to me. Yeah, it was... It, I, I sort of wish that somebody had just let me be a weirdo, like embrace that more. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think this, this is such a key reason why, you know, within the debates about how gender is currently, there's a lot of talk about like the role of parents, you know, like parents have to affirm, parents have to do this, parents have to do that. And it's just so important for parents to be able to lean in in a, in a kind of loving and empathic way so that they can help, you know, maybe set some boundaries for the child, help them understand what they might be going through. And it's really unfortunate that you found the only sense of like family and community in these online spaces that clearly kind of directed you in, in one direction. Um, sure, there were other helpful things about those spaces maybe too, but I, I want to ask something because there's a perception that right now gatekeeping is non-existent and that it's a super easy process to get transition-related medical care, but that it was different in the past. And I'm wondering, is it that you transitioned at a period of time after the gatekeeping had already kind of subsided? Because you said it was very easy to like get SRS. C can you just talk about that? Uh, there was no kind sure. of process around it or therapy around it? There was actually. Okay. So back in 1993, 1994, when I was starting this, there were fairly rigid controls about who could gain access to medicalization. There was a process that was back then called the real life test, which required that you live in your target gender role for an amount of time before starting medicalization, which because my psychologist had been working with me since I was a child, basically. She felt comfortable short circuiting that a bit. So instead of having a, a one year real life test, mine was closer to about six months. And then she wrote a letter for the endocrinologist to start estrogen. And the endo endocrinologist would not have prescribed anything just on a uh, informed consent basis, uh, the letter was required. Mm. And before I was able to get sex reassignment surgery, I actually had to have a second letter from a second source confirming that that psychologist thought that it would be a, an appropriate treatment for me. Um, not only that, though, it's interesting because this was the 90s where testosterone and estrogen were just coming in as kind of the hormonal representations of, of femininity and masculinity. And you were right at the cusp of that because you got sex for you by the sounds of it. Sex reassignment surgery was the only way or certainly the main event, while had you been born 20 years later, it would have been oestrogen. It would have been all about oestrogen. And, you know, the surgery, I, I've met enough, you know, young people to know the surgery is in the distance, but it's not the main event when they're 18 or 19. But for you, it sounds like because of the cultural context. Yes. It, it was very targeted towards that. Different in the times. 90s. So it, it wasn't until I'd, after I'd had surgery and a couple of years later, before I heard the term transgender being used commonly. Yeah. The before that it was two categories. There were cross dressers and transsexuals. And if you were a transsexual that meant that you're on a medicalization path. And if you were transgender that meant or excuse me, if you're a cross dresser, that meant that you were spending your weekends dressed up in femme, but you were not planning any sort of medicalization. And mm -hmm. through that whole time there were people who were frustrated because they wanted partial medicalization but no psychologist would support a process of partial medicalization. 
So this is, that's yeah. where transgender came from. Yeah, yeah, and I remember now kind of in Bob Ostertag's book about the kind of business of hormones, he talked about this, and it's kind of coming back to me as we as we speak about it. And, you know, in one way, we could say that the early intervention with hormonal you know, interventions has obviously become much more easy to access. But if we look at it from a different angle, we could say the move from SRS being like the main thing to giving people time with hormones, it could be a move in a better direction yeah. because there are some reversible aspects of what it's like to take hormones. And so I think that's positive. And even when I hear... Like, for example, non-binary identified kids saying, well, I think I just want to take tea for six months and that's all I want to do. Even though from like a different perspective, I could easily say, wow, why would you want to do this? Like, it's not going to really solve your problems. But on the other hand, it's like, well, that's probably much better than going all the way down the most radical medical pathway very quickly. So that that's, um, I, I, I can imagine that that was... Like you, as a young person, I can't imagine not being at all prepared for what you were embarking on. And and I remember in some of the pieces you've written, you talked about really not having had like much exploration of your sexual orientation or like real life experience with dating and relationships and love. So were you, were you feeling any ambivalence about the surgery or were you like, I know this is the right answer? Like how certain did you feel at the time? And then... I guess what happened after surgery? You were 18 at the time? 19 when I had surgery. 19, okay. I was under a mistaken belief that transition is something that has a, a finite ending point. So I saw surgery as being the end of transition and then I could just go on and live my life normally. Yeah. But every experience that you have is contextualized through all of your experience, <laughs> past experiences. So when you get into your mid or later 20s and your friends are starting to have children, you're, you're not saying to yourself, oh, I'm a, a woman who can't get pregnant. You're saying, oh, I'm a male who is looks looks like a woman who's trying to be a woman but i i can't relate with the experiences that are are happening as as my friends are starting families and i can't even relate with the experiences necessarily of my friends who aren't having families because that's a choice for me it's mm. not then later in life like every experience that that you have it is all through this fact that you are not a member of the sex that you are trying to impersonate. So transition doesn't end because everything that you're encountering after that point has to be understood through the fact that you are a transsexual and not not a member of the opposite sex. Was that a realization that you started to experience or have when you saw your friends having kids? Like, was that what kind of shook your assumptions yeah uh, there's i'm sure there's either something biological happening or something psychological happening but there's something about holding a baby hmm. past a past a certain age yeah that when you hold the baby there's something in your brain that's like oh my god yeah um, and uh you know when you're when you're a kid you think babies are annoying and and stupid mm -hmm. but at some point in adulthood, they 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 become uh, miraculous, oh. and and uh, yeah, that that was sort of an alarm going off in my head. Mm -hmm. uh, another part of of your story that I often wondered about, and uh, was that it w I wondered where you kind of maybe naive at, at nineteen, where you thought you could go and become a woman and have a conventional life. I wondered. Mm -hmm. And m maybe over the next 10 years, you realized I've I've put myself out of that that path rather than I've put myself into that path. It, I'm talking about love, falling in love and things like that. That's exactly right. 
it takes a while to come to terms with that too because there's a, a lot of trying like what am i getting wrong i did everything the right way um i'm supposed to be a woman now why why isn't why isn't this working correctly and it, it's sort of funny to me because in, in over the last 10 years as i talk about these issues very openly mm-hmm. in public i've had a number of people say you're self-hating mm. and i did go through a process of very intense self-hatred not because i had transitioned but because i wasn't able to complete the transition because i had started this thing and and whatever i needed to do to get to the end of it just was not happening and i i felt very alienated from other people i felt like uh subhuman at at times and at other times i felt like i was watching everything happening from uh, uh like above because i was so far apart from it like i could see how relationships between men and women were progressing around me and without being able to really connect to either of them i i had sort of a privileged <clears throat> position beyond mm. it you know what i mean mm. maybe not well i i would like to ask what you mean when you say like i couldn't complete my transition because of this kind of out, outsider role but do you mean that you just couldn't commit to really b- like believing you were a woman or what do you mean so during the my 20s and early 30s i had a number of relationships and a component of those relationships i would be told by my partner <laughs> regardless of the partner uh, you're a beautiful woman to me and you you always have been and will be and that just like jars mm. because i i haven't always been and that's what my partners would need or expect and i just realized that i was not ever going to be able to have i couldn't have physical intimacy very easily because the surgery does not produce a fully functional vagina it produces something that's uh has some physical uh surface similarities. level yeah. similarities but it's not the same thing and so sex uh having that sex with um my neo vagina is painful instead of pleasant i know it's not that way for everybody who's had the surgery but it's still pretty common outcome so physical int- intimacy was difficult and emotional intimacy was difficult because my partners knew it that i was trans but really i think for them they really needed me to play the role of being a woman instead of acknowledging what makes me different as a transsexual it's it's really a, a sort of a toxic element in a relationship and I, yeah. I I just never felt like I had intimacy with a partner. Yeah, and, and I think this really brings up the point about how do we define self-hating? Because I think the current narrative around gender is that if we can just keep lying to trans people to make them feel better, and we can just say, you've always been a woman, you're exactly a woman, trans women are women, then that's an attempt to kind of cover up the acknowledgement of like, there's something different about me. Like, yeah, I had this experience. It doesn't make me less than as a person. It doesn't make me morally bad, but to pretend as though there's no difference or that you haven't even had the complicated experience you had with a medical process and surgery and like changing your body in that way. To me, that feels more self-hating. Like it's a denial of what you've even been through. So I, I find that very interesting. And it, as you talked about relationships, it kind of makes me wonder if some of that reality denial is really for the sake of the other people in the person's life. Like your male partners would have probably, if they were, you know, straight men, would have felt much better about this whole complicated experience, perhaps, if they're like, well, Corinne has always been a woman. Corinne is just a regular yes. woman like every other woman. And I'm very curious. I mean, I haven't even really thought about that much till now, but curious of what the romantic partners of trans people 
what stories they need to tell themselves to make sense of their experience. I'm just reflecting on, on what I said a moment ago, and I, I do feel like I, I have to take some responsibility, uh, all the responsibility maybe <laughs> for how I was feeling about myself in the relationship too, because when you're trying to pretend to be something for somebody and there's this element of every, everybody, like both, both people in the relationship know, and both people are pretending that's, that's on both people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And c can I ask about them, um, the, the, the partners you had, because um, I know listeners will be wondering, um, w were these gay men or were these heterosexual men or bisexual men m m mostly? Um, so th th I can't answer for them. Right. But I was not of, of the men that I've been with. I was not the only uh, trans woman that they have had relationships with. And during that period, I also had a relationship with a woman who uh, was herself gender nonconforming. And, you know, it's <laughs> yeah. So there it's, were more... it's hard. It's hard to say what people were looking for. There were, it was more an outlier kind of community of people meeting each other. Is that right? I wouldn't say it's a community of people. We're, we're all, we're, we're not hanging out at Denny's <laughs> and then figuring out who we're going to date next. Um, it's yeah. just people that you meet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then... Well, well, just to push back a little bit, I, I didn't, uh, I, I had loads of boyfriends and... Um, I, I didn't have any boyfriends who were meeting many trans women and going out with them. So it, it suggests that, that you were a, a certain man's type. Yep. It, well, yeah. Although I will say about these men, because they did date women also. Yeah. If, if you were dating a man who was also going around and, and dating trans women, he probably wouldn't talk about it with you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading Phil Illy's book right now, and there's this section about the type of individuals who are attracted to people with kind of multiple types of sex characteristics or trans women or like pre-op or post-op trans women. Like, it's very interesting. I, I don't know how much data there is about that, but he has some interesting theories. Uh, yeah, okay, so, so, so... So you're having some relationships, you're feeling like you can't actually achieve the kind of either sexual satisfaction or emotional intimacy that you're looking for. Um, did this create a kind of like desire to start rethinking the entire experience that you've had? Or at what point did you... Like, I'm sure it was lots of little points, but like, at what point did you kind of start moving towards the Corinna Cohn that we know now, who's like explicitly talking about all of this yeah. in a really heterodox way compared to a lot of trans activists, for example. So how'd you get there? In 2012, I started a blog to try to figure out why some feminists did not like trans women. Mm. And... I was just trying to explore ideas and pull things off the shelf and investigate them and unpack them a little bit. It's sort of funny. Last night I was in a Twitter space or X space or whatever the heck Elon Musk wants to call him now <laughs> with some trans women who were trying to understand the same thing. Like, how do we find middle ground between, uh, they're saying that the TERFs and the transsexuals and I, I think I know where all that middle ground is now, but it's interesting to watching people like start from scratch and try to figure this out, mm. which is what I was doing a, more than a decade ago now. And I had the very, very good fortune of speaking with a number of feminists who were interested in exploring some of these topics with me. And one of them challenged my notions on what sex es essentialism meant. Mm. And the, the crux of it is, why should I see myself as a subcategory of woman? 
instead of a subcategory of man. And I, I, I was like, Poof. like, oh my <laughs> gosh, that's that's actually right. <laughs> that's actually right. And I, I was co- like, I, I had a lot of coping time after that to try to unpack that because that's actually a, a huge epiphany to to take on at once when you've been living in a, a state of uh, dreaming or a state of delusion for so long. So, so that epiphany got me down this road. It's, it's all incremental after that. And were there many along with you? Cause you, you were, was there many trans women going down that road with you or were you on your own striking out? Going with. There have been a few people that have participated in this sort of journey. I will say that it seems to be a form of torture for some people. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I don't, I don't mean this in an unkind way, but I just have to say this for it to make sense. For a lot of people who transition how other people perceive them and affirm them is a, is a huge component for how they feel about themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you cannot get to the point where your feelings of being, being comfortable with yourself are only coming from within you, then even trying to work through the issue of what does it mean that I transitioned? Uh, is is going to be very difficult because there's always going to be people from all all different sorts of perspectives who will insult you, call you names, try to tear you down. And if you have to get most of your validation externally, then those mean words are going to really start to get to you. And you might be trying to do this work of taking uh ownership i guess of of your body or starting to to realize that you're a a, a modified uh person of your own sex and and not a, a special person of the opposite mm-hmm. sex and uh, mm-hmm. you you'll really get thrown off that journey if you are not able to um feel comfortable in your own skin how how did well, I, I feel like I want to ask two questions. Part of what I want to ask is like, I've noticed that the way you think is very, very logically consistent. And I, I'm aware that I think you work with computers or technology at some capacity. And it reminds me a bit of like the Helen Joyce mathematical way of thinking, like it's very logically consistent. Do you think that that played a role in your ability to get there with like, well, external locus of control. I can't actually base my happiness on others. Therefore, the only option I actually have is this. Like, do you think that there was a connection there? Because I, every time I hear you think through these things, that it just makes so much sense the way you organize your thoughts. And I'm wondering if your background or your personality, or just like if you can say anything about the connection there. I wish that I wish I could say that there was some sort of connection between working with computers and being able to get through these very fraught (laughs) (laughs) emotional and identity issues logically. I think it's just uh, coincidental. I think it's just a personality quirk. I'm not sure how much of this can be trained past a a certain level of innate uh, inclination. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I hope is that by being very visible as I go through some of this process and articulate my thoughts in through podcasts and interviews and and my own writing, that there will be something for other people that have been down this path to relate to, to give them some sort of assurance that they're not the only person who's processing these types of issues and that there's a way to to do so that at least can um, bring you towards a, a, a more peaceful state. We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high quality content for the show. 
To take an even deeper dive and support the show, join our listener community for access to exclusive content, practical tools, and resources supporting gender and identity exploration. We're so grateful to our sponsor, Genspect, an international organization which offers an alternative to WPATH, providing a range of education, resources, and supports to anyone impacted by gender distress, Genspect unites many different organizations globally and gives voice to thousands of previously untold stories. For more info, visit genspect.org. And thank you to our sponsor, GETA. GETA is an association of therapists who believe that individuals experiencing gender-related concerns ought to be treated using a whole person approach. We connect like-minded clinicians, provide educational resources and training, and help people with gender dysphoria find the right help. Visit GETA at genderexploratory.com. And now back to the conversation. And can I, can I just say something like, you know, you, you, you strike me as a truth teller, as, as maybe the, the human trait that has propelled you this direction. And when people go through terrible hardship, they very understandably and often very justifiably blame others. And so arguably some people in your very position thought society needs to change and recognise me as a woman and then everything else will unfold properly. And you uh, and others like you said, no, actually, I've got myself into something here that isn't really working out and I need to seek the truth. Uh, and th- that's a striking difference. And I would say the majority of people would prefer that, um, would prefer to see the blame elsewhere rather than within. It's very, very, very hard to think maybe I shouldn't have done this and maybe there were other roads I could take. Well, it took me at least 15 years to start being comfortable enough to, 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 to be in that space. So if you'd caught me in my mid or late 20s, yeah, I would have blamed other people. Mm-hmm. It's a process, you know, and I think that that's so important for people to, to understand and think about because... Um, you know, I, I meet a lot of parents whose kids are actually going to medicalize and it seems pretty inevitable and understandably they're very nervous because they're worried about their kids well-being. And, um, one of the things Stella and I have been talking about in previous episodes is just like the way a disenchanted transsexual or a detransitioned person can kind of become this like symbol of we have to stop this at all costs and it's very dangerous and like the words, you know, mutilation get thrown around a lot, like all of this stuff. Um, but I, I'm interested in the way people can actually disidentify with the difficulty they've been through so that they can still live, you know, live a good life rather than being a, a perpetual victim or something like that. Though I think there's a process of coming to terms with who has wronged you that's very important. So I don't want to deny that. But we we were talking a bit in Killarney about like this disidentification. And I think that's very interesting. And, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about through your many, many decades journey, like how, how have you gotten to where you are now, which is an acknowledgement of things that weren't quite right, maybe things that you didn't quite understand, but also like being a full person, living a full person life. I'm going to do my best to answer that. I know it was like a long rambling question. (laughs) It it wasn't actually. It's it's that you have previously had a guest on Gender A Wider Lens who used a concept that I wasn't familiar with until I heard her talk about it. But it was the woman who had been trying to transition her younger sons. Mm. Oh yeah, Rose. Rose. She brought up the concept of futility. And the way that she was describing it, it's a type of, so you you get into a, a mode where when something's not going right, you're constantly bargaining. If, if only this, if only that, things will change, things will get better. I can improve the situation. Yeah. I can I can make something yeah. out of this. Um, 
there's there's still something that can be salvaged. And she said, no, there's, uh, you give up everything and you realize that it's futile. And that that's actually an important thing to be able to achieve is an understanding of that something is futile because sometimes you have to give up in order to grow. <laughs> this thing that you thought was possible or achievable, you have to give it up. Well, well yeah. th this is a crucial part for a lot of people's reckoning around mental health, let's say with addiction. Number one, if you're going to get out of it, is a yielding to I'm powerless over this. I, 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 I can't. I have no. I have no more road left, and I have to yield to the fact that this is not the right road, and I have to go elsewhere. And it sounds incredibly similar the way you're talking there. I'm glad that you. I, it was I Rose who came up with the concept, but I, I'm so glad that I listened to the conversation because I think futility is really. The, the idea that I had to to understand. Mm. I didn't have a name for it. I had to figure it out on my, on my own. Oh, wow. But the futility that you cannot change sex and that you can't be in society, even if you look incredibly like a member of the opposite sex, you can't be that thing. You have to give up. You have to give up trying. So what you can do, it's not, it, it is not futile to realize that other people may take you to be a member of the opposite mm -hmm. sex mm -hmm. or for you to have experiences in the world that have uh, some uniqueness, both fr from your, your natal sex and, and your, your target uh, thing that you're trying to blend in as. Like you can, you can have experiences in the world as a transsexual or as a, a, as a trans person. Um, you just cannot have the experiences that the member of the opposite sex has. Yeah. And, and just giving that up and saying, okay, that's, this is, I'm having a unique experience. I'm not having a, a common experience, just a unique one. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't know that that answered no. your question, but w when Definitely. you're asking it, I was thinking about how that. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think you're so right in terms of like the futility that you perhaps arrive to when realizing like I can never actually become a literal woman. But then there's also kind of another step because you become really disenchanted with the whole gender identity concept, mm -hmm. the way the medical model works around it, uh, the idea that you were a woman, like you're, you're kind of over all of that. Yeah. But, but I also don't see that you've jumped into like um, kind of a self-denigrating place around like the surgery that you've had, for example, which I think to the outside observer who's not been through that, I think it's hard for people to understand like how you can recognize intellectually the things you recognize. And then also you do have now a body which is very different and it doesn't fit into categories and there's probably some pain involved. It's not this kind of typical body. So um, there's also kind of a, probably a futility that goes along with like well, I've had that medical experience now. What do I do now? Like, how do I just live my life now? Um, and I think it's important because I think people who are either detransitioning or feeling very kind of disaffected about their medical experience, they don't know where to go. And they see these very polarizing views in the world, which is like either prevent this from happening at all costs, or if you've done this, you're damaged. And I don't think that that is a helpful binary. So can, can you just speak to that for anybody who may be listening, who is in that kind of very ambivalent place? It's going to be very tempting to feel a lot of regret and pain over how your body has changed. And you'll, you're going to, you're going to feel a lot of self recrimination probably because you were the instrument that caused that to happen. Even though there are enablers all around you profiting yeah. from, from those changes, you are the person who, who caused them to happen. And the only thing that, I can say is there, there, there might be like physical pain or physical disability that's associated with some of these changes that 
sucks. Um, but what I would say is that being in this world is a, a, a unique oh. and miraculous opportunity. The fact that we are these weird little creatures crawling around on the planet <laughs> who get to enjoy sunsets. Yeah. And in my case, get to start the day with a cup of coffee, which is wonderful, and end the day with a, some chocolate, which is wonderful. <laughs> And, and that I get to watch my goddaughters grow up and, and learn and become amazing women. Oh. And th that I get to have these friendships. Like, these are all incredible, unique things. And you're going, if you've changed your yourself, trying to change your sex, um, you are going to have pain and you're going to have recrimination. But you cannot let that stop you from building relationships with people and being part of the world. You've, you've got to accept that what has happened has happened and you're just going to see the world a little bit differently and experience it a little bit differently. Some, sometimes in a very inconvenient ways, but uh, be part of the world still. Oh, yeah. Good for you. I love that. Can I ask you, I um, that because of what you've just lifted i'm really glad you said that i'm really really glad you said what you just said um is there a was there a darker time that you you got through to get you here if you follow me and oh, yes was that the, it, the i'm guessing you can put me right was that the 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 years maybe of uncertainty was that worse than an actual full-blown regret or i don't know you tell me when is the kind of most difficult because I'm very aware people listening will be thinking is this getting worse what is the worst what is the nadir of this and then I think people start making sense of of where they're at the hardest part was understanding that I had to give up yeah and and it's if you haven't been through it it's hard to find the words to describe it but you strive and strive and strive and every failure feels like it is because you were a failure of a failure of a person and not because you're just trying to do something impossible and you you just have to give up <laughs> before things get better <laughs> god that that when you put it that way you just think why are we setting up so many people to think that they are failing at something that's so cruel actually yes that's that's why i'm an activist now is because i i know that in order for me to and i know it's going to be different from person to person i, mm -hmm. I can't universalize my experience i just i i it's hard not to because it's the only experience I've had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but I, I really believe that these younger people that we're setting on the transition path are many of them are going to have to go through a similar realization. And it kills me that we are building these deeply entrenched mm. systems of setting young people on a on a path of self delusion and yeah. not giving them any mechanism for being able to uh, give up in a healthy way. <laughs> mm. And I mean, I, I often wonder if like really the, if people, I think inevitably some people are going to transition, even if we did all the things that we can do to improve the kind of medical assessment process and all of that. And I sometimes wonder if the, the most realistic like non-utopian real world solution is to provide i guess the truest kind of informed consent which is like this is a belief that you are actually literally a woman it's not actually that you are and like to talk people through over a long period of time what is actually the process here what are you actually going to be able to achieve and not achieve and i wonder if that's much more humane and less cruel than just being like of course you're a woman you'll be a real woman once this or once that or you are now or whatever 
So I, I'm interested in that, like what would be a real world expectation for how to make this a lot more healthy for people. Um, but I, I do want to, I want to make sure to talk about your activism and your, your testimonies that you've been giving, because that's a huge, um, you're really putting yourself out there in a way that I'm sure has rewards and risks. Um, but I want to hear about when did you, I know you started your blog in 2012. You start engaging with feminists. A feminist asked you a question about categorization that blew your mind. Then a lot of things started to fall into place for you. It took 15 years for you to get where you are now. Why did you start testifying? And tell us a bit about that. Sometime after 2016, there was a noticeable change in the collective goals of the trans community. At some point, being trans stopped being about trying to assimilate into the world as your target sex, and it became really about the identity itself. So be, being visibly trans in the world started becoming a, a much greater value than blending in and, and becoming invisibly a, a member of, of, of society. Along with that has been a lot of major policy changes that have meant that are designed to conflate gender identity with sex, which is really crazy in mm -hmm. a lot of ways mm -hmm. because you have now you have people at, at the highest levels of policy sincerely saying that if you feel like a woman, you are a woman, regardless of what you look like. We're asking that people in democratic societies forget what they know about sex, even their own experience with sex, and just trust everybody that their declaration of what their sex is, is actually their sex. And it keeps incrementing and it keeps ratcheting it up. Well, I think that that's actually bad for all sorts of people, including trans people, because the more that we entrench these ideas that your sex is what you declare it is, it makes it a lot more difficult for people to come to terms with the reality that their sex cannot change. So I've seen examples, many, many examples over the last seven or eight years of people saying, well, my driver's license says female on it now. That means I'm a female. I know. My passport says female. That means I'm a female. I know. It's, it's really crazy because these are legal fictions. These are accommodations that are made from people trying to do a kindness to people who, who have been trying to blend into society as the opposite sex so that it's a little bit easier for them to do that. It, they were not, these accommodations were not designed to help somebody enmesh themselves deeper and deeper into a delusion. But that seems to be how they're being employed. A few years ago, a number of lawmakers in mostly red states started putting together legislation to clarify the differences between sex and gender identity in law mostly around the issue of girls and women's sports initially, but also in some other categories like bathroom access or facility access. And when the legislation came to my home state of Indiana, I decided that this would be an opportunity for me to go and speak publicly in support of legislation that restricts the participation in women's and girls sports to women and girls. So at the time I reached out to a feminist activist group ahead of it giving any testimony and said, I know that you support this bill. If I go out and I give testimony in support of it, would that be helpful for your cause or, or hurtful to your cause? And they said, it would be great if you would do so, please do so. Uh, so I did. The lawmakers were not expecting me to show up, and 
I had two or three minutes to make my case. So I tried to make the very best of it and emphasized that because I had gone through male puberty, that I had permanent advantages in women in sports and that that was going to be the same thing for every child who, who went through androgenization. Uh, I, I didn't mention it at the time. It, it wasn't the right context, but when you're taking these girls and putting them on testo testosterone, they're also going through mm -hmm. a process of androgenization. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's also unfair for girls who've been through uh, years of testosterone to compete with girls. Right. So that's a, that's a weird middle case. Yeah. But uh, girls have, have every right to be able to compete in their own sports category. Mm -hmm. And that right was in, in the United States was enshrined in something called Title IX. And it kills me that under the auspices of, of kindness to, to people who have gender identities, that they're trying to destroy Title IX. So it was, it was important for me. And uh, not only because of my thoughts and concerns about the broader trans community, but also because of the girls in, in my family that I go out and I speak in favor of this legislation. And so that started a ball rolling. <laughs> and can I ask as uh, the, the, the foreigner here, it, 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 I was saying to you before we started that sometimes looking at America, it's, it's, it's impenetrable for starts because there's states yes. and there's this type of law and that type of law and it's, it's really hard. But also it seems to swing wildly from banning or any mention of gender affirming care to um, um, prescribing a free for all, a free for all for, for yes. young children. And so you, you, you really, it's very hard to get any sort of overview, even though I'm really quite immersed with this and I talk it a lot to people from America, it's very hard to get an overview of what way is it going over there? Or is it just massively swinging from state to state? It is presently extremely polarized. The most Republican states, I think, have the right of the issue or on the right side of the issue. The most democratic states have a, a very knee-jerk response to what the Republicans are doing. But I'll, I'll, tr I'll try to give just a quick overview for people who might be baffled by legislative politics in the United States. So beyond our federal government, which is based out of Washington, D.C., and passes a lot of federal laws that, that get pushed down to all of the states, there are 50 states that have all of their own com complete, from, from top to bottom, complete legislative frameworks. And because of something in the United States Constitution, uh, there's, there's a couple of provisions, but states have a lot of latitude for developing and running their own regulatory uh, frameworks. As more and more instances of public detransitioners emerge, Republican lawmakers have been open to and sensitive to the idea, and I, I really believe that this is true, that there is a, a lack of responsible health care being provided by these gender clinics to yeah. these young patients and that these Republicans have realized that without there being a good body of evidence available to ensure them or ensure the public that these procedures are helpful and necessary, that the better thing to do is to discontinue them for now, or possibly permanently, in, until such a time that there, there's really any evidence at all that, mm. that these are effective. I have spoken with Republican legislators in, in multiple states who have a, a lot of empathy to the, the young kids who are being transitioned because, when, because these families do bring these children to, to meet with the Republican legislators. They do meet these kids. And w when the legislators see them, they say, I, I, it's not a boy in front of me. I'm seeing a girl in front of me or, or, or vice versa. And I don't want to do anything to hurt them. 
I, I've met them. I, I, I've, I've talked to the families. But when I, I look at it from a higher level, and when I talk to the, the detransitioners, and I talk to some of the dissident voices in the medical community, I don't, I don't think that this is the right thing. Meaning that so. people are bringing their quote trans kids to talk to the legislators and they're trying oh, yeah. to prove to them that these medical interventions are necessary and life saving and all of these things. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you make a good point. And I've heard Dr. Stephen Levine often say it. He says something along the lines of, I can't write you a letter to recommend puberty blockers. And equally, I can't not recommend puberty blockers. We don't know. You, you know what I mean? That, that there is no evidence that, that the fact is we don't actually know yet. We have to wait. Right. You know, and I, I know which way I, I, I obviously I side myself because I don't think to block sexual development of a child is a good thing. But it's a very good point that we don't mm -hmm. there, nobody can be confident in something that doesn't have any evidence. Yeah. In the long term. And I think one of the things that makes this challenging, and I'd be interested if you agree, Corinna, is like the power of narrative is really huge. And that's how people generally make mm -hmm. decisions. They're emotional decisions. And then we use the information that suits our kind of instinctual or emotional response. And so one of the things we've learned about gender medicine and the studies that we, we have is that youth who are put on these medical interventions self-report doing really well. But in, you know, when we measure their actual functioning, it's not necessarily better. So it's really interesting because these parents are bringing their so-called trans kids to legislators and the kids are reporting this was life saving. Oh, yes. If I didn't have this, I don't know if I'd be here like these really um, emotional and perhaps hyperbolic stories. But who knows? Because we can't go back in time and figure out what would have happened to those kids. But I, I imagine that that is tapping into the kind of like protection harm response that people have. And it depends how you look at it. Like somebody like myself thinks, well, the distress of puberty is required for you to actually get older and know yourself and perhaps make peace with your body. But then somebody else could easily look at that and think, look how happy this kid is reporting he or she is. You know, they are, they know themselves best. The parents know them best. So I know that for people on the outside who haven't really dug into the details the way we have, it's incredibly compelling. And I understand why legislators are in such a difficult spot. Um, how has your testimony been received? I'll give you an example. Hmm. In Texas, I gave testimony before a committee that had both Democrats and Republicans on it. When, when I was finished with my testimony, I received very thoughtful and sensitive follow-up questions from both Democrats and Republicans. They were, they were, they all said that they were grateful that I came and and testified about my story. So a lot of the details uh, that I gave in committee were similar to what we spoke about earlier today, and. My feeling is that most of these legislators from both parties really are invested in trying to do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I, I do want to say something about the dynamics in the United States, because I, I think that this is really difficult on this issue in particular. We have a couple of national organizations that are ostensibly civil rights organizations yeah. that wield tremendous power. Phenomenal. We're, I'm talking about the ACLU. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Human Rights Campaign. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. to, to a much lesser extent, uh, groups like GLAAD that are expert at organizing and have very, very deep pockets. There was a Democrat in Texas named Sean Theory, uh, female, female uh, Democrat, who gave a very passionate and informed speech before the legislative body when, when this, this went to vote explaining why she was 
ultimately going to vote in favor of passing the regulation that would uh, stop child transitions. Mm. And within a day, maybe two days, it was announced that she was going to have a primary challenger only on this issue. And that I think we're going to see this, that that primary challenger is probably going to be better financed by these national groups and their affiliates than this incumbent is. Mm -hmm. Only, only because she voted in favor of regulating child sex changes. Democrats all over this country are afraid of being primaried and that they're going to be pushed out of the power that they have because of the tremendous influence of groups like the ACLU and HRC. So they, uh, they feel like if, if we don't go along with this, then that's going to be the end of my public service mm -hmm. career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. Oh. As we look There's... to the future, now we're coming towards the end. Um where where do you think it's going to go? Seeing as you've been you've been in this world since 1992 or something. Yeah, it's I well, see since Corinna was born because Corinna was born a woman. Yes, as, in her heart. As, <laughs> I was I was assigned male at birth, of course, but By they accident, got it wrong, obviously. Yes. <laughs> What do these doctors know anyway? <laughs> Except, of course, they know a lot when they're saying that gender transition is medically necessary. But the ones who designate your, your sex at birth are quite ignorant. I don't know how to explain <laughs> why the credentials work in one case, but not the other. Hmm. Uh, at, at any rate, uh, I see the, that there's a, a very likely outcome. Yeah. Or let's say two outcomes, okay. but, but one is much more likely. And I say this to all of my... My, my trans friends and, and brethren. The world does not need trans people. Like the human race does not need trans people. It tolerates us. We are extraordinary. We're cool, we're neat. But when we go around and sterilize ourselves on a, on a quest to, for like self-actualization, uh, we've, we've served most of our biological purpose at that point. <laughs> But the world always needs women mm. because uh, this, is, this is just how our species propagates. So what has happened over the last 10 years is that the activists have decided to make women's rights a, a zero-sum battleground. And when you do that, we're going to lose. Like the trans side is going to lose. It has to lose. Because you're, you are implicitly telling everybody you have to pick a side. Do you want the side of... Uh, the species continuing, or do you want the side of um, men in dresses, <laughs> right? I, I know that sounds like a very crude way of putting it, but that's, that's really the value proposition here. Uh, that is what the activists have embraced now, and I can tell you that's a, always going to be a losing strategy. So what we have been seeing just in the last couple of days even from the recording mm -hmm. of this episode is that Sporting bodies all over yeah. the world are starting to say women's sport is for women only. Your identity is great. It's grand. Uh, we love the name that you picked and your breasts look very perky. <laughs> wonderful. Um, go compete with the men, right? That's inevitable. It's going to, it's going to keep rolling. Like this is just where it's starting. These, these are the first few pebbles of an avalanche that's going to come. Men, of all sorts, even ones that have had sex reassignment surgery like me, are not going to be able to be co-housed in women's prisons. That That is definitely going to come. Men, uh, especially ones that are, are physically intact, are not going to be allowed to be co-housed in women's domestic violence shelters. Like These are all changes that are going to happen in policy, and it's going to be unified. It's not going to be just the left or the right that's pushing this, um, everybody's going to get behind it except for the fringe. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can keep supporting the fringe. Mm -hmm. You can keep uh, f trying to find shelter and you're going to find people who are at the fringe who are going to give very fiery speeches about trans rights. But society is going to change so that sex-segregated spaces 
uh, go back to being sex segregated spaces. And the harder that we fight against this trend, the more we are going to invigorate the campaign against us. So similar to what we were talking about earlier, the healthiest thing that we can do right now is to give up because if we keep fighting, we're just going to lose all the ground that we made up until 19, or excuse me, all the ground that we've made up till 2016. The, The peak, like the best point in the trans rights movement was probably 2015. That was probably the very best point. Everything that you've pushed for past that point, um, we're, we're, we're just going to lose it. So you're saying like so, the trans activists really need to stop before they get themselves into a situation that is an inevitable loss. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, brilliant reflections as always from Corinna. So we're going to keep you to ask you about how you talk about gender in your IRL life, in real life life, very redundant. But I think for the main <laughs> interview, we will we'll pause it here. So thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I loved it too. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. Listener support means a lot to us. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. For more information, visit widerlenspod.com. There you'll learn about joining our listener community, how to contribute to our show, and where to find us on social media. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.